So we're very fortunate this afternoon to have uh, five panelists that are going to be discussing this topic. Uh, the moderator for the panel is Karen Albrecht, uh, retired from Lockheed Martin, uh, now a career coach uh, and motivational speaker. The participants who get very comfortable chairs, um, I'm going to have to steal one later. Uh, let's see, what order are you in? I don't know if you're, are you in the order that you're listed? Let's see. All right, so uh, wave when I say your name. So uh, Deborah Factor Lepore, who is um, VP and General Manager at uh, Ball Aerospace and Technologies Corporation. Uh, Jennifer Duke, who is Director of Aerodynamics at Pratt & Whitney. Uh, Beverly Goulet, who is Vice President and Chief Integration Officer from, for American Airlines. And Dr. Sandra Mag Magnus, who is Executive Director of AIAA. Uh, oh, actually, uh, before you get started, uh, the group has decided that it's great for you guys to ask questions, but we're going to ask you to write down the questions on index cards. So we'll pass out some index cards to anyone who wants them. Just raise your hand. I'll be kind of milling about the sides. Uh, I'll give you one, two, or however many you want, and then when you're done writing down your question, I will come and collect the card. You can subtly wave it around a bit. And that will give us the ability to be more efficient in how the questions are brought up and answered. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ella. I really appreciate that. Um, we're we're going to begin by actually asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And since I'm the moderator, I get to do that first. Um, I'm Karen Albrecht. I'm a 1972 graduate of aerospace engineering. I actually completed the program in three and a half years. My class was the last class to complete their whole aerospace degree in East Engineering before they moved up to the building right next door. My first job was at NASA at the Johnson Space Center. Um, we were, I was one of 13 people that they had hired since the downfall after the Apollo program. Uh, one of the big things I got before, coming, before starting work there was Harm Buning actually got me VIP tickets to the Apollo 17 launch, the night launch. So that's the biggest thrill I think I could ever say from a space launch standpoint. While I was there at NASA for nine years, I literally developed the analytical methodologies that were used for the composite structures used on space shuttle when we went from an all aluminum structure in order to lose 30,000 pounds. Uh, I, and I also had another fun job that I got to do, and that was the day I got to show up in t-shirts and gym shorts in order to go through astronaut training in order to be able to set the standards for selecting women astronauts along the way. It was then I found out that low blood pressure would keep me out of space. So I was not able to do that, but I did participate in the longitudinal study of astronaut health for the whole time that it was around. It just retired a couple of years ago was the last time. Is that correct, Sandra? No, it's still going on. Still going on because they told me I was retired from it at that point. I then left NASA to go to Martin Marietta in Baltimore, Maryland, where I worked on the vertical launching system and undersea structures. And then after the merger between Lockheed, Martin, Lockheed and Martin Marietta, I went to Marietta, Georgia, where I worked on the F-22, the C-130, the C-5, and the F-35. And I retired from there about four years ago as the director of engineering, where I had 1,800 people reporting to me. I am also the distinguished alumnus for the aerospace department of the year 2007. So with that, I will turn it over to Deborah. Thanks, Karen. It's great to be back uh, here on campus. I'm a third generation Wolverine. I was born in Ann Arbor, so uh, I do bleed maize and blue uh, for, um, uh, as my husband will attest to, being Maryland guy, which is now in the Big Ten, so I guess it's, it's, all, it's all family. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as, as Ella said, I'm Vice President General Manager <laughs> of Strategic Operations at Ball Aerospace and Technologies. What does that mean? Uh, I actually run all of our Washington, D.C. operations, communications, and strategic development, which includes all of our new, new business, things that are outside core business, mergers and acquisitions, uh, et cetera. So we set this up about a year and a half ago when I joined the company as a way of tying together an integrated approach across the really diverse areas that Ball works in with space hardware, spacecraft, uh, weather and uh, optical sensing 
machine instruments, deep space, antennas, systems engineering, uh, Intel, et cetera. It's a really exciting job for me because it's the first, really the first time in my career that I've focused on what went on top of the rocket as opposed to the rocket itself. Um, I always introduce myself as a rocket scientist and my career had been in launch. So uh, it, is, it is different perspective of uh, uh, what's inside versus just, oh, we launch, we don't really care what goes up, up into space. My career started in the Cold War uh, here at Michigan in the mid-80s. It was still very much with the Soviet Union as the enemy, and uh, I was very interested in spy novels and all the foreign systems, and ended up working on strategic defense systems for a while after my master's degree, and then when the former enemy became our friends with Russia. I had the opportunity to live and work in Russia for almost two years and ran a uh, Moscow office of a think tank called ANSWER, and we helped bring Russia into the space station program, and I led the analysis of using Russian engines in US launch vehicles, which you might find a familiar topic uh, that I actually wrote uh, a lot of the policy that is in use today. My expertise was in engines, got to know the Russian engines, and that led to an opportunity for a startup that wanted to use the engines in a commercial way. So uh, up and moved to Seattle and did a couple of startups there, Kistler Aerospace, which was using Russian engines, the NK-33s or Aerojet uh, AJ-26, which just flew on Antares, were, were my baby. From, uh, from way back when we were hired to do the due diligence of whether these engines existed, were they any good, and could we use them? And uh, the answer, of course, was, was yes. The ups and downs of startups, really exciting, um, helped raise over $400 million, sorry, over $600 million in private capital for what was then the first privately funded uh, space vehicle, launch vehicle, the K-1. Sometimes when you are the first with the idea doesn't mean you are the one that actually proves it. Uh, we did the first idea for NASA on doing commercial resupply of the space station. And uh, Kistler didn't do that, but as we see now with SpaceX and Boeing and Orbital doing a lot of work in that area is uh, really fun to see all of that come together did another startup called Air Launch. I was president of that company, was a small company funded by DARPA and the Air Force, a small rocket out of the back end of a C-17 to do small satellite launch into space. Different kind of business model, uh, but really exciting in bringing a systems perspective together on uh, air and space systems, as well as all the politics to go into that. Then did a little academic sabbatical at Stevens Institute of Technology for a couple years in systems engineering and some research for the Air Force, and then joined Ball. So I'm really happy to, to be here. It's kind of the culmination of a lot of things in my career and happy to share a lot of my experiences with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Beverly. OK, uh, well, as, as, as you know, I'm, I'm the chief integration officer at American Airlines, and I'm sure you all are thinking, so why am I here? Um, it gets even worse. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, have, um, I have two degrees from Michigan, uh, one in history and one in law. Uh, so the closest I ever came to the engineering school, um, and it was when it was still down on the other campus, was to have a roommate one year who was an engineering student. So, um, But nonetheless, I'm delighted to be here. It's been a long time since I've been in Ann Arbor. Um, but I do work for uh, what is now the largest airline in the world as a result of our merger with U.S. Airways. Uh, and I guess more pertinent, uh, we operate a fleet of about 1,500 aircraft. It uh, breaks down about 900 uh, mainline aircraft, narrow body, wide body, uh, and about 600 uh, regional aircraft, mostly uh, regional jets at this point. Uh, we also employ a large number of engineers. We employ about 550 engineers, uh, really in, in a whole variety of uh, disciplines. Uh, obviously, uh, aeronautical is at the top of the list, but. Uh, everything from mechanical to civil to um, those other things you guys know about that I don't. Um, so um, I, I will say um, uh, we're, we're, um, um, 
we are actually eager employers of engineers right now. We have a whole lot of work going on uh, in, in a number of different areas, uh, partly related to the integration, uh, obviously to the extent that we, uh, the two companies have uh, uh, the same type of aircraft. We've got to modify one aircraft or the other to make them um, uh, harmonious. Uh, but we're also going through a very uh, large uh, refleeting uh, right now. Uh, we're taking delivery of uh, just about one airplane a week at the main line. Uh, and then we're always doing things to our airplanes uh, to uh, either improve the economics uh, of, the, of the airline or to enhance our customer experience. So things like uh, uh, lie flat seats, and, uh, which, which in and of themselves are these um, sort of amazing uh, things that move in all kinds of directions. Uh, but things like in-flight entertainment, and, and uh, uh, I think it's um, fair to say that those keep, uh, keep our folks scrambling. Uh, so that's, that's my uh, situation. Um, I practiced law for about 20 years before moving into finance, uh, and I've been uh, in one finance-related capacity or another for about the last 15 years. Thank you, Beverly. Sandy. I think I'll continue uh, with your thread, and it, which shows that um, in aerospace, you can have a diverse set of experiences and a diverse set of career uh, choices, regardless of how you enter the industry, and that we all do it because we just love it, and it's a really cool thing to do. And I think that kind of uh, picks up from your thread and, and really defines my experience with aerospace. You know, I, I grew up wanting to be an astronaut you know, somewhere around middle school. I had no idea how I was going to do it. I just knew it was something I wanted to do. I didn't know anything about engineering. And you know, we, we get back to talking a little bit later about diversity in engineering. I think a lot of it has to do with exposure to students at a young age to even know that they have choices. Because you don't, if you don't know that you have the choice, you can never make a conscious decision to go do that. But um, I didn't know anything about engineering. I knew science. I knew physics. I knew chemistry. I knew biology. So I defaulted to physics. And I remember when I started high school in 1978, the, uh, the, there was a big newspaper article uh, right before school started about NASA selecting the first female astronauts. And that was a really uh, important thing for me because now I saw that there was a path that, oh my gosh, man, I can go do this. Now there's a way that's being defined for how I go do it. I, you know, at that age, you just knew I wanted to go do it. I had no idea if there was a way to do it or not to do it. But now I saw that somebody had done it, so now that was a path, which really emphasizes the, the, uh, the importance of role models as well, which hopefully we can talk about a little bit more. But I went and studied physics. And when I was studying physics, I discovered engineering. It's like, oh, this is kind of cool. You can take the physics and you can do something with it. That's great. <laughs> um, and physics is a great place, uh, field to study, by the way, because you can take it and use it anywhere. Um, so then I uh, sort of got tired of school. For those of you who are approaching your senior year can understand this. Or you kind of want to go out and see what the real world is all like. Uh, even though I wanted to get a doctorate, I was like, oh, I need to go work for a while. So I did kind of, by chance, that was 1986, and the aerospace industry was on the upswing. And I grew up uh, near the St. Louis area. McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Company was hiring. So just really, it was almost by chance, I interviewed with them and got a job up there. And I was doing stealth technology on aircraft, you know, right out with my physics degree while I was working on a master's degree in electrical engineering in the evening, because I got interested in electrical engineering. The A-12 program, for those of you old enough to remember, took an unfortunate turn about the time of the first Gulf War, and there was a whole bunch of us that were sort of at odds, and I thought, okay, now it's kind of time to go finish my PhD and apply to NASA and be an astronaut. Well, while I was working on aircraft, I got really interested in materials, because a lot of what you do to build aircraft really hinges on the material systems you're using, and of course, we were using some interesting material systems because of the stealth technology aspect of what we were doing on the A-12. So I ended up going back to school to do a PhD in materials. And that's when I applied to NASA and, and joined NASA. So um, I didn't know, as a seventh and eighth grader entering high school, with only knowing an interest in physics, know that years later I would end up not having a PhD in physics, but I would actually get interested in materials, because I didn't even know materials existed either. So I think that it really em my story really emphasizes the breadth of opportunity and the breadth of experience that you can have in the aerospace industry. Because no matter what your engineering background is or your, your degree background, if you have an interest in, in the, the, the cool aspect of things that fly, you can find an experience in the aerospace industry to go fulfill that and then learn even more about that as you go, as you go along. And I think that's really the power of our industry. But to make a long story short, I, I got into the astronaut program. I've flown uh, three times, uh, two shuttle missions, including the final shuttle mission three years ago, and lived on space station for four and a half months. Um, 
my flying days uh, you know, came to a close and I had to figure out what to do next, which is really hard. I mean, you think, what do you do when you've done the only thing that you ever really wanted to do? You know, all my friends were freaking out when they were graduating from college because they were like, oh my gosh, what am I going to go do? I knew what I wanted to do. I want to be an astronaut. So here I am, you know, 16, 15, you know, 30 years later or whatever, and I'm done being an astronaut. And it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Now I know my friends were all freaking out when I was 20. So I had to really <laughs> sit down and think about what I want to do next. And, and I decided to approach it from the viewpoint of what is it that, are, that really excites me? What am I really passionate about? And for those, that, those of you who are contemplating your, your careers, I think these are good guiding questions. Always focus on what you're passionate about. I'm really passionate about aerospace. We have a really cool industry. We are great people. We are excited about what we do. We engage really heavily in what we do. We are passionate about what we do. We do great things. So how do I stay engaged in aerospace? I was interested in nonprofits because I think um, it'd be fun to do some work in nonprofit space in the future. I was interested in learning whether I had any leadership or management skills because you don't really demonstrate that so much as an astronaut. So this opportunity came uh, uh, up to engage with the AIAA and I thought, oh, that'd be fun. That'd be really fun. And so they decided they were going to take a chance on me, hired me, and that's what I've been doing for the last two years is working as executive director of AIAA, which has given me an opportunity to stay engaged in aerospace, although in a completely different way than I have before. So I, I started as an engineer, then I did operations, and now I'm doing kind of, I don't know what you call it, advocacy, leadership, management, whatever. And so it's, it's really kind of, a, it shows what a mixed bag mm -hmm. the, the industry is and all the opportunities that are available in the industry if you're open to them. So I would, I would encourage you to be open to these kinds of opportunities as you, as you go through your career. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> yeah. I could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer. Well, well, thanks, thanks a lot for the thread, actually, and, and similar to what Sandy was talking about. And aerospace engineering um, spans um, a, a, a breadth of what you could what you could do. You don't have to be an aerodynamicist um, working on on complex aerodynamic uh, aerodynamics physics. I happen to do that. I'm the director um, of the Aerodynamics and Thermal Fluids Organization at Pratt Whitney. Um, but I, I, my career, I graduated um, from University of Michigan in 1992, and one thing I'll say is it's, it's great to be back here. Um, I came here uh, recruiting um, early on in my career, and then I kind of uh, took a stay. I, I haven't been here for quite some time, and it's, it's really great to be back on campus and great to be in the company of such um, distinguished women here on this panel. Um, so. A little bit about me and my organization. We are essentially responsible for the functional aerodynamic design of the entire uh, jet engine. So, those of you, you, you guys, all familiar with Pratt Winnie? <laughs> yeah, global leader in, in, in jet engine design, manufacturer, and services. Well, so really, it, it all starts with the aerodynamics if you think about it. Uh, my organization um, is responsible for the, uh, the fan design, the compressor, uh, the combustor, turbines, military exhaust systems. Uh, we also work very closely with the airframe manufacturer on the cell integration. So um, it, it, it really starts with the arrow when, when, when you think about um, you're concepting up a new uh, a jet engine proposal that's going to be a world class in terms of fuel burn, in terms of emissions, in terms of noise. It starts with a what does it have to look like? Um, and and re, that's where the aerodynamicists really come in. Um, we, uh, we, we look at the cycle. Uh, we look at what kind of overall pressure ratios we're trying to target. We look at the, um, the capabilities of, um, of the materials, but it's a matter of um, concepting out what, well, how many stages um, does a compressor have to have, how many airfoils, what do the airfoils have to look like. Um, so we, we get involved from the very beginning of the concept, but then we also take that concept through, through fruition all the way to certification and even um, we're very involved in um, all of the aftermarket endeavors to continue to improve the products. And really what it's about is uh, we work in multidisciplinary teams. Um, with many engineers um, across the entire department in design, in structures, in manufacturing. And if you think about it, when you go through um, a design of an airfoil, you go through hundreds and hundreds of, of iterations, um, both aerodynamically, structurally, um, and manufacturing to, to make it work. And so, so we're involved in that entire phase of the design, but we're also very involved in the validation of the product. Um, we go validate the product. We run development engines, certification engines. We, we run them to the limits of, that are way beyond uh, normal operating conditions to test out the structural integrity and the reliability. 
And uh, my team sees that uh, all the way through. Now, um, being in aerodynamics and, and having it, the whole concept kind of start with aerodynamics, we're also very involved in um, technology development and research with universities um, and, and uh, research with uh, many of the, um, the, the, the government um, agencies like the FAA as well as, um, as, well as NASA. So, so we, kind of, we kind of do it all, and it's really exciting uh, for me um, and for my organization being at the center of it all. I, uh, I started off, um, I graduated with a, a Bachelor of Science degree um, in 1992 from aerospace engineering, and at that time it, it was a pretty difficult um, environment to try to get a job in, um, to be quite honest. And I had uh, pretty set goals in what I wanted to do. I had um, interned at a small CFD uh, firm um, very close to Ann Arbor. Um, I had interned at uh, General Electric, and I, uh, I said, you know what, I want to be in the um, um, civil aviation sector. I want to um, use CFD, and I want to do aerodynamic design. And I was looking at Boeing. Um, I was looking um, at uh, Pratt & Whitney. Uh, and I was very set in those goals. Now, now, the second goal that I had was I wanted to get out of the Midwest. I grew up in Cincinnati, went to school in Michigan. So um, I wanted to get to one of the coasts. And uh, the third goal that I had was just to not end up in mom and dad's basement. Because um, it was hard. You know, a lot of, I mean, graduating as a woman in magna cum laude, a lot of people were not getting offers. And I remember I just sent my resume to Pratt Whitney. They didn't come on campus, but they invited me out. They took care of me. And they really, uh, they, they proposed some opportunities um, in combustion aerodynamics. They proposed some opportunities um, in the performance systems analysis group, which for me was a little <laughs> bit off. I wanted to do detailed aerodynamic design. And they said, well, look, we got propulsion systems analysis. And, and when they spent some time with me describing what they did on a system level in terms of cycle analysis, um, in terms of um, test engineering, um, in systems analysis, um, it, it became intriguing to me. I said, you know what, this might be a really good place to start because it'll give me the breadth um, to understand how the engine operates um, at, just at a systems level. So I, I, I walked away with an offer in February, which was great because I wasn't graduating in, until May, and so I had um, a, a couple months to finish up my degree and to, to feel comfortable that I had a job. Um, and I've, uh, I started out in systems analysis, was there for four years, and I said, you know what, I really do want to do what I set out and do detailed aerodynamic design, applying CFD methods. And uh, at that time, I went into a rotation in the turbine aero group, and I stayed there for 10 years, um, which was quite long. But for me, that 10 years, in that time frame, I got married, I had two kids. Um, they offered me uh, the ability to kind of slow it down when I needed to slow it down. But um, I was actually working part-time, and I decided that, you know what, I, I can do more. Um, and it was challenging having young kids, um, being in an environment away from family, but I said, I can do more, and I want to do more. I want to manage an integrated team, not just aerodynamics. And so at that point in time, I sought out an opportunity, and they made me the um, component integration manager and I led the um, high, turbine, uh, high pressure turbine design uh, for the, the new gear turbofan engine. So the first couple of applications of the gear turbofan engine, I led that, um, that component integrated product team, which consisted of the structural design, um, the uh, detailed mechanical design, manufacturing, heat transfer. So I did that for a few years. And then they kind of pulled me back to the systems area. They said, you know what, we'd really like you to come um, and be the, the, the chief of systems analysis for all operational commercial engines. Uh, so I did that um, for a couple of years. Um, and at that time, it's, a, it's about managing um, the fleet in the aftermarket, um, continually um, investing in the fleet that we have out there to improve uh, the fuel burn, to um, improve the durability and the, reli the reliability of the motor. Uh, I did that for a couple of years, and then I was given, given kind of an odd opportunity. Um, Paul Adams, who is now our pre the president of our company, at that time he was senior vice president, came to me and said, well, you know, I'd really like you to be my executive technical assistant. And um, the reason I took that job was because of Paul, because he was an excellent mentor um, to, to really learn from. 
And um, while I took that job, um, Paul took over operations as well as engineering, and then he became the, the chief operating officer of the company. So um, it, was, it was a good thing that I took that role because I got to see the entire company, how the enterprise um, is managed from the top level. I uh, interacted with people from finance, um, with people from group strateg um, strategic development, um, and it really rounded out my network. Um, so you, you do those kind of roles for a few years, and then I was offered the um, opportunity to come back and, and lead the um, aerodynamics organization. And um, I'll tell you, so it's been 22 years. People think, hey, you've stayed in engineering for the most part. You've stayed in the same company. But to me, it's felt like I've just worked in so many different positions and got to see so many different aspects of the, of the business, all different elements of um, the product design phase um, and validation phase and aftermarket that I feel like I've had a number of jobs at a number of different companies. But after 22 years, uh, every day is a challenge. Every day there's something new. I have an excellent team of people in my organization of discipline managers, technical fellows, people who are recognized throughout the industry for being experts in their field that I, I constantly learn from. So um, for me, it's, it's, it's a beginning um, right now. And um, I'm proud to say that I come from Michigan. Um, because I, th I think it sets me apart. And, and actually, I, I look at um, some of the leaders in the organization, and a lot of really good people come from Michigan. So go blue. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing is actually asking some questions. We had put some surveys out to even the students here, and we got some questions back from the students that we're going to talk about, and also some additional questions. One of the questions that did come up is, why are we having a panel on women of aerospace? So let me, let me kind of put it in a little bit of perspective, OK? In the United States, we only graduate about 75,000 engineers. In 1972, when I graduated, we graduated 30,000 engineers. Only 300 of them were women. That's 1%. I was one of those 300. Think about that from an overall standpoint. In 2011, we graduated like 75,000, only 18.4% of the graduates were women. This country is in desperate need of engineers, and we have an untapped resource that is not, and so how can we encourage more women to come into engineering? I don't think in 1972 we could have brought a panel as distinguished as the panel that we selected today to have come and talked to my class back in those days. And so I think it's very important to understand that, that we really need to tap into the, all the resources of our youth of this nation in order to encourage them to go into engineering. And the, one of the greatest untapped resources is our women. So if that helps you at least understand why we're having this particular panel, I think it's important that we have a huge amount of talent in this country, and we need to gather that talent and have them help us move to the next 100 years so that 100 years from now when we're all standing here, right? <laughs> um, we can talk about that we have 50% of our graduates in this country are in engineering, are female, okay? So with that, uh, there may be a little bit of repeat on some of these, but one of the things many people ask us is, one, why did you become an aerospace engineer or what got you into the aerospace industry? So I'm just kind of throwing that question out to our panelists um, to say, you know, how did you get into it? Um, I got into it similar to Sandy. I wanted to be an astronaut. And uh, I know why I could not make that happen. But I think it's important, you know, that many people kind of go down a path because of that. Ladies. So I grew up wanting to, I like math and science. So I thought, OK, I'll be a doctor. My dad was a doctor. Except I don't like blood. OK, so that was out. So then I said, well, I'll be a dentist. Except I don't like bad breath. So now <laughs> being a dentist was out. So I thought, well, I'll be an engineer. But I had no idea what an engineer did or what you needed to do to become an engineer. I didn't exactly have uh, teachers who inspired that thought. So I went to a career day for high school junior girls at Cobo Hall, downtown Detroit. 
and went to a session by the Society of Women Engineers, not realizing that later I would become president of SWE at Michigan. And uh, I was sitting there and listened to this gal talk about the day that her, the car engine she designed drove down the street was the best day of her life. And I thought, that is so boring. So, <laughs> <laughs> now what am I going to do? <laughs> Now realize, growing up in Michigan, in the Detroit area, I lived on a Ford street, drove my Ford Mustang when I worked at Hydromatic down the street, a GM plant for the summer. They didn't like that either. Uh, but I thought, you know, what, now what? What am I going to do? So I'm sitting in the back of the room thinking, oh, great. And uh, the space shuttle had just flown, first flown when I was in high school. And there was a brochure from Bendix that was doing automotive parts and aerospace. And I'm like, oh, that's it. I am going to get my undergrad in aerospace engineering, my MBA, I'm going to be head of NASA. Done. That was it. <laughs> so my plan in that moment when I went from thinking, you know, cars are kind of boring, to uh, mapping out that instant part when I was a junior in high school, which is fairly late. You know, a lot of issues with getting young people interested in continuing in STEM careers is we lose them in about middle school, if not earlier, with peer pressure about, or is it, do you have to be too smart, or do you have to dumb it down, or is there something different to do? So, um, so I did go into aerospace. Um, I had came to Michigan. That was an easy, an easy choice. I did look at other schools. I will admit that uh, the prospect of football ended up winning the vote of where I went to school. And like I said, I was born here, so that was in my blood. Um, I did have a Harm Bune story, a Harm Bune story. If you mentioned that, that he influenced you a little bit. So I came, made my mom and my best friend, we came to Ann Arbor, because I said, well, I'm going to do this research project on aerospace engineering and the space shuttle. So it was when the senior design project was doing their final presentation, and they were doing um, a gas can, so the shuttle was going to fly uh, these small experiments on, on shuttle. And I went to the presentation. I said, this is perfect. This is exactly what I'm going to do. Harm goes on sabbatical my senior year. There is no senior space design class. And uh, we could do a finite element model analysis of the previous year's uh, project. Boring. You don't want to do that. So uh, I did aircraft design instead and ended up doing a lot of that in uh, grad school as well, kind of creating a graduate um, design class in, in aircraft, which I think gave me that diversity view of it just doesn't have to be space, but there's a lot of components that go in to thinking, to systems thinking, different approaches, and it doesn't matter exactly what you work on as long as you stay um, close to what to what your passion is, as Sandy said. And for me, that was doing things that had never been done before. So that moment in the back of the room when I thought the car engines are boring, um, ironically, I stayed in propulsion and in transportation. So clearly, I was influenced by Detroit. Uh, it just was higher and faster and, and farther. Um, but the point was doing things that had never been done before. And to this day, I use that as a guiding principle for, I don't know that I realized it so much throughout my career at some points. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me that that's what I use to decide what I'm going to do. Is it still true to my passion? and? what interests me the most. And it's probably the best piece of advice that I give to people of, you know, why do you do what you do? What's the thing that's going to inspire you every day? And finding whatever that is, if it's a new technology, if it's educating students who are learning for the first time, if it's doing a different business model, learning a new language, going to a different country, um, trying things that are really cutting edge. And for me, that's been the most important thing, and this kept me in, in aerospace. Now, I didn't do my MBA. I started out in the MBA program here, quit after three weeks, quit, mm, sounds bad, but I changed my mind and uh, came back to Arrow. I knocked on the door and said, mm, I'm back. Do you mind if I get my master's uh, in Arrow? 
so wait a minute, you just spent four years telling us you're getting your undergrad and you know, repeating all my career goals. I said, yes, but I like aerospace. And as a 20 year old trying to do something different, get an MBA, having no work experience and wanting to be head of NASA tomorrow, probably nobody would hire me. And spending two years away at the time of the industry that I wanted to be in, best decision ever was to get my, my master's in aero. It's a credential that you could take everywhere. And when I lived in Russia, that was the common language. You know, I might not have, uh, my Russian was pretty good, uh, I was young, I was female. Those are hard things in, in a different culture. And by the way, we were the enemy just the day before. So you add all those things together, the language was math, physics, engineering, <laughs> and uh, the, higher, the higher education. So really good tools that, um, that have served me well. Okay, anyone else? Well, I, I'll pick up on, real quick, since it picks up on your thread, it's the, the whole idea of you know, you had a plan, and then, oh, that's not what I was interested in, or that, because the more you find out, the more you can, I think, the more you can expose young people at an early age to what, like I said before, with what the possibilities are, the better choices they can make. Because, yeah, I had this plan to be an astronaut. I wanted, I, I had no idea what that meant. I, I, liked, I liked math, I liked science, I wanted to fly in space. That was really the extent of the thinking that I had going on at that point. Um, and as I, as I went through the progression of my career, and I started being exposed to a lot of different areas, then I saw what other opportunities were available, even up to the point where I left the astronauts to come to AIAA. So I think the, the key is, you know, follow your passion and, and be open to new experiences and take yourself out of your comfort zone occasionally because that's where you really will do the learning and, and understand if there's something else out there that excites you that you don't even know about it. And I think that really describes how I ended up in aerospace a little bit because I got the job offer from McDonnell Douglas. I had no plans to go work in the aerospace industry. I was gonna go straight through and do my PhD and then apply to NASA and be an astronaut. But I was open to the idea of, oh, I'm gonna go work for a while and it just so happened it was an aircraft company and, and that really got me involved in the industry in a completely different way than I expected. But you have to be open to those opportunities and I think that's really the key. I'll just say a few things. Uh, when, I, when I was in high school, I had very little to no exposure to engineering. I, uh, I excelled in math and science, and I remember people coming in and talking to us about degrees in accounting, an actuary degree. Now, my dad's an accountant and said, no way, no way. I'm not paying for you. I'm, you can go to school in Cincinnati, but I'm not paying for you to go anywhere. Uh, you can live at home. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was junior year, and um, I... I really liked my physics class. And my physics teacher was the one who said, you know, you ought to really consider a, a degree in engineering. Um, there were no career fairs or no people from industry coming in and talking to us about it. And um, my dad said, yeah, I could pay for that. Uh, yeah, I could, I could help you out there. <laughs> and uh, so, but it sounded really interesting. And then you know, I started looking at the, uh, you know, astronauts, but I'll tell you what, what really did it for me um, is, is Top Gun, all right, junior year, Top Gun. <laughs> and, and it wasn't Tom Cruise, but it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was Kelly McGillis, PhD in astrophysics, giving direction on the pot to the pilots on how to optimize their flights. And I thought, wow, that, you know, a, a woman in that position basically guiding um, astrophysics, telling the pilots how to fly the jets and do it right. I said, I like that, I could do that. And that, that hence became my fascination um, with, with jets and with jet engines and with aircraft. And, and, and then um, my mom suggested Michigan. And I said, well, you're just saying that because you, you grew up in Michigan. And then I came to see the campus. And even though it was January, it was freezing cold. It was a beautiful campus. I said, this is where I want to be, the aerospace department. I can't remember what it was re rated at that time, but it was you know, very, rated very high. And I said, OK, this is what I want to do. Um, and I went and, and, and I, I, I went through that and, and I, internships played um, a key role uh, when I went to school here. I interned at GE. I interned, at, like I said, at a, a small CFD uh, consulting firm that, that really um, continued my interest um, in the field. But the one thing that I'll say is um, my daughter right now is 14 um, and she's got engineering in her blood. My husband's also an engineer. Um, I didn't tell you he, he graduated from Ohio State, but <laughs> somehow we're still together. But um, <laughs> we're, uh, the, the, the thing is, at 14, 
um, the exposure that she's had to engineering, even in middle school. Uh, they have people from industry come in and talk to them. Uh, University of Connecticut is very active, um, and, and they invite the kids out for a whole day where they get hands-on types of experience with um, the, the types of things that you would think about from engineering is uh, relating the, the physics of the equations that you learn at school and how they apply um, real, you know, in, in real world. Just uh, some simple little um, hands-on experiments that they're doing. And um, I think the engagement is really encouraging that I see. And, and they even isolate out the, uh, the female population in middle school and take them aside and have um, female role models come in and talk to them. And so I, I think that that's going to be a driving force to, to seeing more women um, in engineering. And my daughter, you know, she's in, um, she's able to take engineering classes in high school. She's taking an intro to engineering where she's doing CAD work. Um, right now, and um, she's taking an advanced science class and had to pick a project. And the other day, and I had nothing to do with this, she came to me and said, you know what I want to do? I'm going to do, um, I, I'm going to look at how you optimize a fan blade for wind turbines to see which one would generate the most power. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm resisting. I'm not going to get involved. I'm telling myself I'm not going to get involved. But, um, I, you know, I, I, I just, I really think the engagement is an important thing. Um, and you see the engagement now through um, several states are uh, sponsoring um, STEM um, types of initiatives uh, with the industry and with the universities. Anybody, any other, any other additions? And I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of mine. I actually decided at 12 years old to become an engineer. And two things were that. Um, I read in a Reader's Digest that engineers made about $10,000 a year. Now this is back in the, er, the 60s when this happened. And I always remembered my father saying, if I only I made $10,000 a year, we'd be rich. There's one. But the second thing is I also wanted to be an astronaut and the only way I thought I could do that was to become an aerospace engineer. So between my junior and senior year, they actually had a course for high school students here on campus. And we got to go to many of the different organizations. And of course, Harm Buning gave the one on aerospace engineering. And my sister will even attest to that. When I came home, that said, I know why I want to be an aerospace engineer. And it's not just to be an astronaut or it's not just to make a lot of money. It truly really was. And um, I finished school in three and a half years. And I tell you, it has just you know, been probably the best I've ever had, I can probably count on one hand of my nearly 40 year career, the days I did not want to go to work. And those were the days I had to lay people off. So if, if you get an idea of the passion about this, that's exactly what it is. Um, let's jump to another, uh, remember we do have anyone who wants to write up questions, please feel free to um, write up some questions. We'll, we'll, we'll try to take those if we can. But uh, the next question is, so. What do you believe is the next big aerospace invention technology? Hmm. Lots of choices. Um, so a couple things I'll throw out that, that we're working on at, at Ball. Uh, we just, uh, how you can do lighter weight optics in space, uh, deployable membrane optics, I think is, uh, uh, transformable technology of rather than taking a trying to build big glass mirrors you know ball ball fixed they made the glasses we made the glasses for Hubble so uh, have a lot of expertise that goes back even to the glass jar business ball that's the company the jars um, no jars anymore there is a book though jars to the stars uh, that you can read on on how we how we got there um, <laughs> So I, I think that uh, you know, structures in general, lightweight structures, whether it's for um, things close uh, on the ground, close to the ground in near Earth orbit, but really getting to deployable lightweight structures uh, and membrane technology I think is really big. Uh, green propellant, different ways of um, being efficient and sustainable and getting high performance as well. We're working on a project that is a hydrazine replacement, uh, the green propellant infusion mission, and then to be able to infuse that into standard interfaces, standard satellite buses. Um, I think processes, you know, how we change how we get to space and what we do in space is an important technological advancement. If you think about uh, standardization or um, uh, different ways we 
use contracting methods, commercial approaches to getting into space, you know, changing the way we do business. I think, uh, as you see, just the announcement this week that NASA made for commercial crew, a lot of that is just changing how we do business uh, in, in space since the government's been the primary, primary investor. And of course, propulsion. Um, uh, the discussion today, as I said before, on use of Russian engines and U.S. launch vehicles, we have had that policy for over 20 years, and really the U.S. has not made an investment in uh, particular Earth orbit propulsion in, uh, you know, 50 years. And that's why we do rely on the Russian engines, and, and it's sad. I mean, the first thing you have to do, you've got to get off the ground, and that takes a lot of energy. And thrust to weight ratio you know, has to be greater than one. So we've got to get off, off, the, uh, off the ground first and do that in an efficient and cost-effective way, and then really um, changing what we do in space, whether you use depots. You don't have to take everything with you all at once. Um, how to combine things in space differently and create different concept of operations and different architectures that take advantage of traditional systems, small systems, data, uh, innovations, which kind of goes back to how we, how we do business in space. So a diverse list. Uh, I, I guess from the standpoint of um, somebody who's an end user of a lot of this technology. I have no idea what you just said, <laughs> except some things resonated. Um, you know, when you, when you take all of that really cool stuff and you, and you then apply it to things that, that we do, I mean, what, what we're really excited about are some of the advancements we've seen in recent years in terms of the fuel efficiency of engines. Uh, we've got uh, orders for both the, uh, the, uh, the new uh, Airbus uh, Neo aircraft as well as the 737 MAX where the, the uh, fuel efficiency of the engine is going to improve by about 12%, uh, uh, I think, which, which when you think about fuel being our second highest line item uh, after, after employee costs, uh, it, 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 it is very meaningful to the bottom line. Um, the 787 that we'll start taking delivery of later this year is going to be, it really is, I mean, I haven't flown in it yet, but from everything we've heard, it's going to really enhance the customer experience, um, the, the composite materials that are being used in the aircraft, uh, the things like the, the, the humidity in the aircraft cabin. I mean, I, I recently flew for 16 hours from Dallas to um, uh, to Hong Kong, and, and I know how dried out I felt, um, and, and to think that that, that that customer experience is going to improve dramatically because the humidity in the, in the aircraft cabin is going to be improved is the, are the sorts of things that, that we think about as we think about what the, what the customer proposition is going to be and, and what the impact on our bottom line is going to be. Um, I'll just state real quick, I, you know, taking your question and applying a little bit more to the space side with the, the, the career opportunities and the, um, the, uh, the types of things that you'll be able to do in the space field, I think, are going to be different. You know, for example, there will be potentially ways to be an astronaut and not work for the U.S. government. So there's going to be different kind of opportunities arising because of what's going on in the space world right now that uh, I, don't, I don't even know what they're going to be, but I think the the generation that's currently going through school uh, and graduating in the next four or five years is going to be poised to take advantage of some of those new opportunities. And you know, there, there are a lot of things that people are doing now that didn't exist 20 years ago. So there's a lot of, of change, and the change is happening faster and faster. So you just need to be open to that and, and be ready to challenge yourself and not be afraid to go and, and try those new things. But I think you know, this technology is going to drive a lot of career choices in, in new and exciting ways and, and opportunities as well. Well, you talk about integration mm -hmm. of technologies as well. Uh, you know, with both of those, uh, we just did a semi-autonomous motor project that was showcased at the Indy 500 where we took uh, systems engineering approach, complex systems, and integrating uh, approaches that have been used in aircraft and control systems and applied it to Sam Schmidt, who is a quadriplegic and was injured in a race 14 years ago, he drove the car in the Indy over 100 miles an hour using uh, his head and a bite sensor for the brakes. And that technology, uh, we're in partnership with Air Force Research Lab in uh, finding different ways that you could work with uh, cockpits. Do you need 
humans, uh, you know, the crew in Triple uh, Seven, for example, and what you need just for the sleeping and the recovery, what could you do autonomously? What could we emotionally allow people to do, or psychologically and from a risk standpoint, allow to do? Um, pilot fatigue, what could that do for that uh, improvement in, in operations and human factors? And then it, that same technology could help wounded warriors and other uh, people who have serious brain injuries and uh, physical injuries, and how could they have a better quality of life? And that is integrating a lot of different technologies that we've seen in aerospace and computer sciences, uh, systems engineering, control systems, et cetera. So, so the one thing that um, I'll add, and it's along the lines of um, what Beverly, what you mentioned as far as the fuel efficiency of the engines, um, when I look at the next big aerospace innovation, you think about um, the trends, um, and the trends are towards sustainable aviation. Um, people talk about green engine technology, um, we're um, constantly um, moving towards um, an environment in which we are um, regulating noise and emissions to uh, more aggressive levels. But it's also sustainable for uh, the customer. It's sustainable for the airline operators. So we have to think about sustainability in all those realms. Um, and the other driving trend that I would say is that um, the impatience of society. I mean, if you think about it, uh, my kids can't believe that I, I grew up without cell phones, without the internet, without having immediate access to information. Um, we're becoming more and more demanding. Uh, we want to get where we want to go quicker. We don't want to fly into a hub. We want to go point to point. Uh, we can't tolerate delays and cancellations. So all those kind of tie together in terms of, well, well what's going to be the next big thing? And um, uh, Beverly mentioned what we're doing um, in terms of reducing uh, fuel efficiency for the engines. We've come up with the geared turbofan architecture. Um, Pratt Whitney pioneered uh, that innovation. Um, and we're, um, we're launching that, we're certifying it, um, and uh, we're getting that out. And that, that was a big game changer in terms of fuel efficiency, um, noise and emissions, 15% uh, fuel efficiency, um, a 50% margin um, to the current um, emissions um, of regulatory standards. But um, when you think about where we're going in the future, um, we can go ultra high bypass uh, um, jet engines where we're continuing to grow the fan, um, to move more air and reduce fuel efficiency. Um, but at some point in time, there's practical limitations um, to the current um, aircraft engine um, installations that we've seen over the last 50 years, which are under wing mounted um, engines. There's going to be a, a practical limitation in terms of ground clearance. Um, you eventually run into um, the cell drag. You run into weight limitations. So the technologies that are going to spawn off of that will be, um, I think, like Deborah mentioned, lighter weight structures, lighter weight materials, as well as considering um, alternative um, um, aircraft engine installations. Um, I know we did a study with MIT on some em embedded engine um, types of um, airframes. Um, there's an opportunity to contour the fuselage uh, to get lift. You got to think about how you're going you know, to, when you, when you do have a very large aircraft that holds um, several hundred passengers, how you get them on board, off board very quickly. And it's also going to be a matter of knowledge management, um, of collecting the data on board um, with reduced order models to deterministically predict um, what's going to happen and how do, I, how do I minimize the delays and cancellations. It's a, it's a matter of knowledge management um, as well as the technologies that we introduce. And it all has to come together to bring value to the end customer. And the end customer is um, the passenger who doesn't want to pay any more for the ticket. And it's the airlines that have to stay in business when the margins of profitability can be very low and sometimes a um, matter of filling the last couple of seats is whether you're going to make a profit or not. Um, it becomes very important. So responsible introduction to technologies. While we as engineers love the more complex widgets, um, we also have to uh, introduce them in a responsible, sustainable manner, um, basically uh, for the whole industry. Okay, okay um, we've, um, we've had one person actually um, ask us that they don't believe there's any shortage of engineers. And so let me ask the panelists, do you, do you have enough engineers in your company right now? No. Okay. We always need more. You know, it's engineers and scientists and people who I think have cr are critical thinkers and systems thinkers. Um, 
you know, you need, I think having a good, when you go into engineering, you get a really good background in how to solve problems and how to solve, how to find answers to things that don't have an answer maybe and that we have to figure out how to make things happen and how to um, work around what seems to be obstacles and how to manage and balance uh, risk or perception of risk and you know we somehow make the we have really complex things that we do in space and uh, and yet you find the conservatism to make decisions is extreme. So it's kind of this oxymoron. So I think um, it's hard to say, are we, are we short of engineers? When we look competitively internationally with what India and China are doing, the data just makes your head spin of, of the degrees that we are not producing and they are. So that's scary if you try to think about what this is gonna be like 100 years from now and uh, will we, what will, the American workforce look like for engineering, I think is scary. Yeah. Um, whether that's in each of our companies on, a, on any certain day, hard to tell. But en masse, I think it's something that um, America needs to continue to invest in technologies and the future of innovation. Yeah, well, we, uh, as, I mean, we, we are not in business as usual mode, obviously, when you're trying to put two uh, companies as complex as airlines together. Um, but as recently as a couple of weeks ago, um, we, we decided to establish a committee uh, that will exist in order to prioritize the engineering work that has to be done, uh, because there's just a lot more between uh, ongoing maintenance, repair, uh, all of the business as usual stuff, the modifications that are in response to government mandates, uh, the activities that we've got going on with regard to the integration, the activities we've got going on with regard to aircraft coming and, 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 and leaving the fleet. Uh, we are seriously um, um, constrained. We're trying to fill some of that uh, gap with, with contract uh, engineers, but um, it's, it's certainly something that, that we need more of and that, uh, um, that, that you know, I, put a plug in for, uh, for you know, working in airlines is a pretty cool place. Uh, you've got travel privileges that, that'll uh, allow you to, to go anywhere in, in the world virtually uh, at virtually no expense. Uh, we've got a co-op program where we bring university students in to work essentially a, a spring and summer or summer and fall. Uh, we do a lot of our hiring through, th through that program. We've got maintenance bases uh, at five cities, uh, Tulsa, Charlotte, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Phoenix, and uh, Dallas. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a growth area for us um, about uh, coming back to the whole issue of, of, of women, about 15% of our uh, engineers right now are, are women uh, of the positions filled within the last year or so. It's about 20%. So I think consistent with some of the other statistics. Uh, um, but we are very much uh, committed to um, you know, getting the work done uh, and to um, uh, continuing to expand the ranks of, our, um, of all of our employees, including women. And I'll, I will add that, you know, once I retired, I actually went into career counseling and I've uh, helped students and second career people um, write, rewrite resumes to make them sing a little bit. And one of the things when I talk with the companies is they say, just having a degree in engineering won't hack it anymore. What they're looking for is a qualified person that is well-rounded, that exhibit many different types of abilities, which are leadership, teamwork, communication, flexibility, initiative, and problem solving. Those are kind of the top five things, and I, don't, I, don't, I probably didn't miss one, but that's pretty close. And they say, part of the issue that we do have is many of the graduates that we are getting, all they've done is go to school and get a degree, and they don't have the other aspects of the, what the, many of the companies are looking for. So there's a shortage in many cases of what many companies refer to as a qualified engineer. That's what a company will tell me, okay? I'm, not, I'm, I'm kind of telling you what the many of the companies will tell me. Um, the next question is, th there's several questions that are very similar, okay? Is um, what are we doing to encourage more women, more diversity into engineering? And since it's aerospace, I guess even into aerospace <laughs> engineering. What are we, what are e any of you doing right now? You know, it's, it's really funny, the, um, the STEM landscape, there's a lot of programs on STEM, 
all over the country. Some are local, some are national, and it's just a very crowded landscape. And it's really hard to determine which ones are, are successful and which ones are not, because it's hard to measure. I mean, how do you know if you're doing a STEM program that you've lit the spark in that one person at that particular moment, right? So it's one of those things you have to keep throwing ideas out there and keep engaging these kind of activities and kind of realize, you know, maybe in mass you're making an effect, although it's hard to measure individual levels. So I think there's a lot going on in the STEM area. Um, I've run across a few different programs over the years. You know, I've, of course, been speaking to students for decades now, and I've run across several programs I think that are very valuable, and that one of them is called Expanding Your Horizons, and there's several different forms of this around the country, and this one is, is focused on young ladies, but you could do this with any kind of uh, age group where you take, it's a Saturday program, and then it's locally organized, and you bring in, in this case, women role models, and they run workshops, for the, the middle school girls throughout the day and their hands-on activities. So the students, the, the young ladies are getting exposed to, to women who are doing, the th doing these different unusual kinds of tasks, if you want. It's not just science and engineering, it's really almost anything, pilot, journalist, uh, chemist, you know, there's a lot, a wide variety, but they're, and they're doing activities related to what that, that uh, female role model's job is, and so they can connect in the activity with seeing somebody that looks like them doing it, and that, I think, is a very, a very powerful thing, but I, I think um, every one of us in the room, you know, we're here because we're passionate about aerospace, and so you're reaching out and touching, you know, a high school class, or speaking to the Cub Scouts, or the Girl Scouts, you know, that, that kind of thing does make a difference in aggregate, even though you might not think from your little uh, one, you know, you talk to 20 kids, you know, maybe you, you don't think you're making an impact, but if, every, if each one of us takes that on to reach out and do that in aggregate, it's gonna make a big difference. So the most important thing, again, is exposing uh, young people to the possibilities. Because when you grow up, you know, your, your whole world is your norm, right? If you eat dinner at five o'clock every night, you think every family eats dinner at five o'clock every night. You, you don't know enough to know there's a lot, a lot of variety out there. So reaching out and back in to grade school even and, and trying to, to open uh, young people's minds to the different possibilities is, is really what's important. And I think, you know, that all four of us up here, I, I dare say, are probably inv involved in that in some aspect or another. But that's really what needs to be done we have to reach out as a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ro having role models, as you mentioned, is really good. Um, when I was here, I never had a female professor. Uh, and that we didn't have, you didn't see female role models to look up to and say, oh, I want to be like her. So it was more the individual passion about aerospace and doing something that had never been done before and sort of ignoring all the other, uh, the other uh, parts of it. And the, so one part is the role model for young people, male or female, and encouraging them to explore and solve problems. I think kids are naturally curious, and then we somehow kill it because uh, you know we tell kids, "Oh, don't do that! Don't do that!" Uh, and and keep them in a in a little box. So programs like the AIAA does, and as you said, First Robotics. I think you were really active in that. Um, Girl Scouts, SWE, a lot of programs for the young people. And then I think the the other part is getting is making sure we have diversity in the workforce and that it stays in the workforce and it's sort of promoted through the workforce. So I would say for me personally right now, that's where a lot of the focus is. Um, serving as a role model, owning the leadership, uh, recognizing that uh, you can share advice on career paths, on problems that come up with, and things that people don't even really want to talk about but happen uh, in, in the workplace, uh, on opportunities, uh, making sure there's not discrimination, um, encouraging uh, diverse applications when there's jobs coming up, that there is always a diverse profile, having goals, having the leadership of an organization, not just talk about it, but do something about it, and make sure that you promote, uh, not just encourage, but actively promote and sponsor uh, diversity, particularly as you get into management and leadership ranks. And I th think that's incredibly important for for all organizations to do, academia, government, 
and industry. So, um, so that's something I really, I personally do mentor a lot, huge passion, um, passion, very passionate about mentoring and passing it on, whether at any level, and then making sure that we are putting people into positions of leadership and making sure that our teams are very diverse. And I think that's a really good point, is the, um, um, you want to continue to promote diversity um, within the organization. But the one thing that I'll do is uh, I'll distinguish the conversation um, between diversity and representation. Um, people uh, often mix that up as being the same, um, and I don't view it as being completely the same. Um, as a female at Pratt & Whitney, I'm sure that I show up um, in terms of their diversity numbers, um, but being female is not what makes me diverse. It's the background upon which I grew up, um, being from, from Ohio, um, going to school in Michigan, having a different outlook um, than, say, um, the people that grew up in the Northeast um, that work at my company. And I would argue that even if I had 60% of the people in my organization um, as women, we don't right now, but if we did and they were all from the Northeast, I would not have a diverse um, organization. But um, the, the numbers are actually quite healthy. The representation numbers are, are quite healthy for females um, across our engineering department. Um, and the challenge um, becomes uh, at the, ma the management level, continuing to keep people engaged, to con continuing to help promote their career. Um, and that's, wh that's where the challenge uh, really comes about. And uh, I'll be honest, for me, it was a matter of um, my, my management constantly left the door open. They came to me with many opportunities, and there were times when I just said, nope, I'm not quite ready for that. I'm not in a place in my, in my life where I want to take that on. But um, they didn't let up, and eventually um, I was in a place where I wanted to take on more, and, and I did. Uh, so I personally, um, being a woman and being a leader of a department of several hundred people, um, feel a personal responsibility to continue to promote the opportunities uh, that people have. And, and not just females, but we have many um, high uh, potential diverse candidates um, that are um, male from me men from different backgrounds. And um, I feel the personal responsibility to continue to touch people personally, let them know the opportunities they have, um, and then get them thinking about, you know, maybe taking on um, um, something new and something different because we tend to get kind of embedded um, just in the, the everyday, hey, I like doing this, I feel comfortable. And uh, my job is to, to kind of push people in an in a area where they might not feel comfortable, but it might be a very good opportunity for them to thrive and move forward with their career. I think that does touch on something, though, that, that I think um, can be done better. There's a, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, diversity in hiring uh, and in providing the opportunities, but especially when you encourage people along quickly, uh, I think uh, the employer has to be very sensitive to providing the support once the opportunity is provided. Because I think, I think too often you see situations where people are, are um, thrust into opportunities, um, sometimes for purposes of making statistics look better, but if the, if the support isn't there to help that person move into that new series of challenges and, and be successful, um, at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's not going to succeed. So I think particularly, as, as the point was made, um, as you move um, into, into the more senior ranks, I, I think that's particularly where the emphasis needs to be going forward, um, because without that, that infrastructure of support, I don't think you'll ultimately see the kind of, 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 of advances that, that, that I think makes for a, a healthier uh, workplace. Okay, we're getting, we're getting, we've got about um, 15 minutes left, so I'm, I think the next question I'm going to do, believe me, we've got lots of questions up here, and there's just absolutely no way we can answer every one of them in this time frame. But uh, one of the, the themes that is coming through right now is having to do with leadership. And the thing is, what are your tips to be a strong leader, and is there something that women do that they excel in more so than maybe their male counterparts. So that was kind of a theme that was running through several of the questions. Uh, that's hard to answer not being a guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you guys think, so I can't. I can't. Um, but I, I think it's important to be a good listener, and it's important to, to um, 
have courage to make decisions because I think what I've seen in my career, and I saw this on the A12, is that people were afraid to make decisions even when they were authorized to make them because they they weren't they weren't comfortable standing up and you know you're responsible for the decisions you make and you have to be prepared for that and that's important but it's really important to listen to the people around you it's also important I think to demonstrate the behaviors which you want others to demonstrate around you as well and and sort of walk the walk and and of course you have to have faith in yourself and faith in your decision-making processes I think that's important um, I think for me it's always been about doing what I enjoy um, and doing it as well as I can so that the performance will speak for itself when other opportunities come up. Um, but I've never, um, I've never believed that you can plot where you want to be five steps from now and figure out what each of the, the linkages is to get you there. I, I think more important just to figure out what am, what am I doing right now? Is it, is it, is it, what's, it, is it what's exciting me uh, and, and am I doing as, as well as I can uh, in, in whatever the capacity is at that point. I would add collaboration. I mean, collaboration Absolutely. is really, really important and it's kind of a style of behavior and how people work together and especially during times of ambiguity or change and when there is no clear answer and lots of people have different opinions of of what could or should or should not change and how you make decisions how you get you listen to the different alternatives especially when you don't know exactly what to do you don't know exactly what answer to make and uh, finding ways to um, to get input and collaboration really gets buy-in. It uh, gets people to feel more accountable and responsible and then when the decision is made, you're like, okay, you may have people don't agree, but you went through a process uh, to collaborate. I also think that word is used a lot in research and in academia of collaboration across disciplines, across uh, different areas of expertise, across, it could be in a different business unit. You know, we tend to, uh, our academic studies are very stovepiped. You know, the, the, if you take aerospace engineering requirements to graduate or EE or ME, and then you try to put together a collaborative cross-disciplinary team and uh, say a senior design project and oh yeah but the double E is you got to do these 10 things and the arrows you got to do these 15 things and you got to do all that well how, how does that work well guess what our organizations tend to be like that as well so uh, finding people who know how to do this and getting in organizations to be able to cross collaborate and cross pollinate opportunities you know that's where you get into complex systems systems integration systems engineering approaches and uh, leaders who can do that and you don't necessarily have to have the leader in the title in the position power you know there's leaders throughout organizations who can encourage that kind of thinking and behavior which I think is uh, really important I, I would second the collaboration and I, I always add to it collaboration and communication mm -hmm because um, those two kind of yes, go hand in absolutely. hand and collaboration at all levels of the organization is extremely important um, as you get up into the higher leadership levels the communication aspect um, becomes also very important um, to I, I'm also I, I'm a lot of times stuck in situations where I want to buy to get more money for the work that we want to do and it's a matter of first collaborating appropriate with the appropriate people to make sure they're on your side but then communicating it mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the right manner. And, and that goes for anybody um, in any type of leadership, leadership situation is um, how, how good you are. You could be an industry expert in a certain area, but your ability to show people how you bring value at a broader and higher level is very important. Um, and I teach that at the practitioner level because it's very important that they understand how what they're doing fits into the bigger picture and they can communicate it in order to continue to get advocacy for it. Um, and the communication one is, is a tricky one, um, I would say, um, it, for women as, as you get um, into the higher ranks um, in my personal um, situation. It is tricky because men are, um, I, I think, generally more aggressive 
Um, and so you got to think about how you're going to communicate to get your point across in the most effective manner. Um, and it becomes kind of an art. Um, but it is something um, that you know you continue to develop, and with positive mentors, um, many are available to me. One sitting right here, um, front row, Dr. Epstein. But I, uh, you know, it, it's something that you that, that that you work through and you continue uh, to develop. Um, and the other thing I'll say um, is uh, make an impact. I teach people to make an impact, and often to make a, an impact means um, taking risks. Um, and when you take risks, it's very important to articulate what you know, what you don't know, what you're going to learn from a certain test, what could go wrong, and be prepared um, for the outcome. What we do is, is hard in the gas turbine um, business. It's a very complex um, machine. And when we, we, that's why we run tests, and we run tests to learn. And it's our ability to react um, to those learnings and to continue to develop the product. Um, and that's what I teach people is that um, the, you know, the reason we're going through um, a whole validation program is so that we can learn, we can adjust, and we can perfect. And so people can't be afraid to learn. And I actually I felt very encouraged um, walking through the labs with Pete, and he's teaching um, the young engineers, the sophomores, and they're all hands labs, that um, he knows there are certain pitfalls that they're going to they're gonna come up with and they're going to fail, and he wants them to fail themselves and to figure out how to make it work the next time. Um, and that's actually a very important part because that's in any kind of technology development that happens over years and years, um, you're going to continue to learn new things and you're going to have to perfect. So those are the two key aspects that um, I try to promote within the organization. So Let me just make, well, sorry, real quick. There's a, one thing that you should keep in mind too, there's a difference between leading and managing. You know, when people, when people say, oh, oh, you know, you're such a good leader. Well, are you managing well or are you leading well? You can do both, but they're definitely separate. So just because you're a manager doesn't mean that you're, you're leading well. Just because you're a leader doesn't mean you're managing well. So, so these are two different skill sets, and it's very important to keep that, keep that in mind because they're not interchangeable. Sorry, Deborah. So all, everything that we've just discussed now sort of applies whether you're, regardless of gender or background, you know, good leadership traits regardless. But I do want to point out the, uh, there is a lot of research about stereotypes in business and different leadership styles of different uh, cultural backgrounds, gender, et cetera. And there's actually a really good research paper that was published by Catalyst, which is uh, an organization most well known for c encouraging diversity. They were the first ones to publish for the Fortune uh, 500 companies uh, who who did, or actually it was all of who didn't, have women in the C-suite and on the boards. And it was uh, an element of peer pressure of pointing out, you know, if 50% uh, of the population and of consumers are uh, of women, where are women represented in the leadership ranks? Uh, and that particular study, I think the PI was actually from Michigan, from the business school, and the name of the study was Damned If You Do, Doomed If You Don't. And this, it's funny, but it's, then it's not so funny because it's talking about uh, stereotypical biases that we just get in society. And in this, this particular research uh, had uh, United States and I think they also talked to um, some European companies as well. But it talks about the different behaviors that a style of leadership in a man is considered very strong, but if a woman does that, it's uh, very weak or vice versa. And being aware of those biases and approaching them, identifying them, talking through them is really important. There's also some research that the American Society of Engineering Education has uh, published, and it's actually some results from National Science Foundation advance grants, which funds research for looking at diversity. And uh, there's some advocacy tips that uh, North Dakota State University was looking at, and it's posted under ASEE in their Women in Engineering Division. And that actually, they have oh a dozen or so tips that they've been creating to actually say, well, what do you do about these things? How do you handle them? What if somebody comes with you with a communication issue, you don't know how to handle it? Or what if you realize you have an institutional bias and you don't know what to do about it? So they've collected through this research, a set of advocacy tips. It's uh, generally looking at academia, but they could apply to any kind of organization. So I think being aware that there are 
there are differences. It's not that they're good or bad, they're, they're, they're different. And being aware and thinking culturally in the organizations, what we expect, what behavior we want to see, we need to emulate and our leaders need to do that. And also uh, try not to have a double standard of look, saying that we want a trait, but in Susie, this is a, a bad trait, but in Steve, it's a good trait. Uh, and being aware of that. So there's a lot of things out there I think it's important to, to address and, um, and work through so that we can have the diversity that we are looking for. Okay, we got about two or three minutes left, so we have several questions still left, but we're not gonna be able to get to them this afternoon. So what I'd like to do is ask if the panelists have any burning statement they would like to make at this time. <laughs> um, Y'all got about a minute each, okay? <laughs> Well, my number one piece of advice maybe leaving today is to pass it on. Uh, mentoring is really important. Learning is important. If there's anything that you take away from our conversation just now or in the day and a half that you'll be here is pass it on to somebody in your organization, in your community, in your neighborhood, uh, fellow students, fellow faculty. Uh, this is really important to share our experiences, collaborate, communicate, and uh, just because you're here is not a, a, just a privilege, but a responsibility to share uh, what we've learned, help people know about space, the importance that it makes in our daily lives, and any tips that you may uh, come out with. So think your homework, think of that person you're gonna pass on to over the next couple of days and weeks about what you've learned here today. I'd say find something you're passionate about, and if the first thing doesn't work, try something else. Um, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing whatever it is you, you choose, and uh, I've made a couple of uh, right-hand turns in my career, and, and, and I think it's important to be true to what, what, what you feel passionate about. Yeah, I would say don't be afraid to try new things. A lot of people uh, put limits on themselves because it, it, you're going outside of your comfort zone or, or it just, it, it's not what you're trained in or it's not something you ever thought that you were gonna be doing or maybe you're feeling a little bit unself-confident about approaching that, but I would encourage you not to put limits on yourself. If I would have put a limit on myself as a, a young lady dreaming of being an astronaut thinking, oh gosh, I can never do that. Who gets to be astronauts? You know, I never would have been an astronaut. So just be open, you know, be aware that maybe when you're thinking like that and go, oh, okay, wait a minute, I'm trying to put a limit on myself, poof, get rid of it. And, and try these new opportunities because your careers are going to progress in ways that we can't even predict. And so you have to be ready to, to try that. And when I took, I'll tell you, when I took the job at AIAA, after I, I hung up with Mike Griffin on the phone, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, what have I just done to myself? Because this is to was totally like nothing I'd ever done before. And I was really, really nervous and I was really, really uncomfortable. And I thought, wow, this is, this is good. This means this was a good opportunity for me. This is a good decision because I'm about to go get a whole new set of challenges that I've never had before, and it's going to be fun. So try and keep that kind of an attitude, and you, and you can achieve anything, really. I would just say um, keep in mind, for, for those of you that are near graduating or early career, um, what you think is interesting and what you like to do is going to change over 30 years um, of your career. And, um, you shouldn't be afraid to take on new opportunities and new challenges. Um, and like Sandra says, it, it gets uncomfortable for a little bit. Um, as you're going up the learning curve, every time you switch to a new position or you go out of your discipline and um, you take some broadening opportunities. But I would just say, um, uh, don't be afraid to engage yourselves into uh, activities um, to, uh, to learn about um, how you might want to branch out and um, stick with your passion. Um, your passion's gonna take you maybe from one thing to another to another, and I look back and um, I never imagined that I'd be in this um, position 22 years ago, but it just sort of one interest led to another, led to another. Um, so just, just keep engaged and um, realize when you get the itch and it's time to move on, sometimes you have to take the initiative. Sometimes people don't approach you, you've gotta go approach them and say, hey, you know, I, I kinda like what you got going on there. I think I might like to do that. Can you tell me more about it? Um, so continue to engage yourselves and um, have fun with your career. Okay, and um, with that, I think we are finished with our panel this afternoon. Thank you all for coming today. For those people that don't know what Orion is, it's our, our human deep space exploration vehicle. Uh, carry our astronauts further than we've ever gone before and uh, eventually on.